We've said a lot about the nuts and bolts of dialogue, tags, their function, over-attribution, etc. But I haven't said much about the dialogue itself. What should my characters say, Ro? Just kidding. If you've made it this far, I give you far more credit than to ask that. Just as I wouldn't presume to tell an artist what to paint, I wouldn't tell a writer what their characters should say. But I do have a few, hopefully useful words, to say about how they should say it. This part can get very tricky, and like most of this stuff, it's not an exact science. But there is some linguistics involved, and here I go about to state the obvious again. Nothing your characters say is real. Score another shocker for Roe. But I say this perfectly obvious thing to say this. Dialogue in fiction is fictional. The more fully writers embrace the artifice of the fiction, the realer their dialogue will become. And maybe even that's too obscure. Let's start with the reality of speech itself. Linguists study how people speak, and in order to do this, one of the tools they use are recordings. Often, they'll also use transcripts of people talking to one another. This is real-world speech, mind you, and this is what it often looks and sounds like. Yeah, it doesn't help the tree, but it protects, keeps the moisture in, uh uh-huh. Because then it just soaks up moisture. It works by the water molecules adhere to the carbon molecules that are in the ashes. It holds on, and the plant takes it away from there. A pretty far cry from Shakespeare, no? It's at least a stone's throw from Raymond Carver's Man, Boy, and Girl, too. Print journalists often run into this problem quoting sources. How and how much to clean up natural speech can present stylistic problems as well as ethical concerns. But in order to present a readable story, most people's speech needs to be cleaned up at least a little. People generally don't speak in complete sentences. This is the first layer of artifice to fictional representation of dialogue. If you strive for realism in your dialogue, you may end up giving your readers something a little too real. Always remember we're playing a fictional game, and fictional conventions apply. Real people rarely speak in complete sentences. Characters often do, and that's fine. Realism in dialogue is often paradoxical. The closer your character's speech gets to the transcripts of linguists, the odder and more unnatural it may seem to your reader. By contrast, readers often think nothing of a character as articulate in conversation as a Pulitzer Prize-winning writer on the page. Here's Father Mark from Richard Russo's novel Empire Falls talking about his grandmother over a cup of coffee. Father Mark smiled. It's pretty to think so. Of course, none of this had anything to do with the grandchildren at all. She was punishing and rewarding her own grown children according to her own mean-spirited sense of justice. Those who stopped by to see her during the week, who did her bidding and fawned over her, were rewarded. Those who didn't got coal in their stockings. See what I mean? This kind of dialogue is common in literary fiction. Most readers don't think anything of it. If you have any sense for syntax, though, The following sentence jumps out in particular as being a bit too perfect for everyday speech. Those who stopped by to see her during the week, who did her bidding and fawned over her, were rewarded. A sentence construction with the verb at the end like this is rare in spoken English, especially when it's separated from its subject by a subordinate clause. Ro wish Ro could talk so good. Ro on the page, though? Well, that Ro is just as blazingly articulate as I want to be. And I can be when I want to, Roe takes long overdue facetious bow. A lot of dialogue isn't quite as pretty, though. Here's something quite a bit more standard from John Grisham's page-turner, The Pelican Brief. The president sneered at the windows. Cole continued. Okay, you're right. There could be a thousand copies out there by now. But it's harmless. Unless, of course, our friend actually did these dirty deeds. Then, then my ass is cooked. Yes, I would say our asses are cooked. How much money did we take? Millions, directly and indirectly. And legally and illegally, but the president knew little of these transactions, and Cole chose to stay quiet. The president walked back to the sofa. Why don't you call Grantham? Prick his brain. See what he knows. If he's bluffing, it'll be obvious. What do you think? I don't know. You've talked to him before, haven't you? Everyone knows Grantham. This, of course, is much closer to the linguistics transcript. 
But again, the reality in the speech is a product of the artifice in the writing. A good example of this is that the short responses and sentence fragments, fixtures of everyday speech, are responses to questions that the characters pose to one another. The narration that poses these questions sets up the snappy responses that seem very realistic. In reality, though, a conversation like this is destined to be a bit clunkier with pauses and ums and ahs and starts and stops. This is a good example of a writer embracing the fictional artifice in order to present dialogue that seems more realistic directly because of the way it's crafted. See the paradox in that? Such is the fictional game. Okay, let's take this one step further. Both of the above examples make use of what linguists would call standard American English. And if you know anything about linguistics, you know there are many more dialects of English, each of which is nuanced in its own way. Indian English is vastly different from Scottish English, which is miles apart from standard British English, and that dialect seems about a world apart from Caribbean English, which is spoken a little bit differently from island to island. I've had the pleasure of living in Scotland and the Caribbean, and when I lived in both places, I sometimes found myself translating the local English dialect for visitors who were native speakers of standard American English. I myself grew up with a regional dialect of American English as my native tongue, and I can remember while watching the BBC seeing rural dialects of American English subtitled in the same way most of my fellow Americans would need the subtitles for movies like Train Spotting to understand what was going on. What do we do about all this? This is tricky in more ways than one, but if you're going to write a character's dialogue, and part of that character's idiolect is a different dialect of English, you need to be intimately familiar with that dialect. Getting this wrong, with the most charitable interpretation, could reflect linguistic and cultural ignorance on the part of the author. You don't really want to get this wrong, so do your homework on this if you're diving into these waters. That's for starters. The second important point is to apply the same paradoxical thinking to dialect as you would to standard American English. Remember that it's all artifice. So, your narrator shouldn't be transcribing the way a character with a dialect speaks any more than a narrator would attempt to present a linguistic transcription for a speaker without a regional English dialect. Writers who successfully capture dialect and dialogue aren't generally capturing an accurate depiction of the dialect. They're capturing a representation of the dialect that's watered down enough for the average reader to understand. Let's take a look at an example of Caribbean English. The following audio clip is from a news report documenting the experiences of people who survived a hurricane. The woman speaking is a Jamaican transplant living in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Please take a moment to read the transcription first, then we'll hear from the speaker in her own words. To wondering where the water coming from. When we look, the house just lift up, and all the matches just it just take the matches from me like somebody grabbed the matches from me. But I have my three-year-old daughter, so I just um, hold on she, and while holding on she, I have to put in her right in front of me, and then um, to ba my back to the wind for nothing that coming won't catch she. Anyway, I end up with this. I end up with a lot of bruises. My daughter end up with a fracture arm. My son gets some stitches, but I just thank God for life. Trying to capture anybody's spoken English accurately is a difficult task. Linguists even have their own specialized alphabet that captures the nuances of speech far better than our alphabet. The International Phonetic Alphabet has its limitations too, though, because any alphabet is just a set of symbols that represent sounds, and no two people speak these sounds the same way. Also, it's worth noting after hearing that clip and reading the transcription that no speaker actually speaks English the way it's traditionally written. 
For example, while listening to that passage, you might have thought that her English deviates vastly from standard American English, and sure, there are differences in grammar, syntax, and pronunciation. But there are also places where this speaker articulates words more closely to the written word than an American would. One example is how she says the word water, as written, water. Americans say water. If you met an American who said water, you'd notice it immediately, and you'd think it was odd. Try recording a conversation between you and some friends, and then transcribing some of it. Really listen to the actual sounds everyone produces. You'll realize a lot of what people speak is very different from written English. So even the standard American dialect of English on the page is an artifice almost everyone has come to accept without thinking much about. Unless you're a native Caribbean islander, that clip probably took some effort to process, a lot more than if you were speaking to this person in the flesh. And if this were dialogue in a story, your average reader would certainly have to slow down to catch the meaning in places. This changes the dynamic of dialogue drastically. It's no longer as immersive and free-flowing if your reader is struggling to process its meaning. So just like the transcription we started with, it wouldn't be a great plan to represent a character's speech faithfully in this way. Let's look at someone who represented a Caribbean dialect on the page as beautifully as it's ever been done. Here's Nobel Prize winning poet and playwright Derek Walcott's main character, Macaque, in his play, Dream on Monkey Mountain. I have lived all my life like a wild beast in hiding, without child, without wife. Is thirty years now I have looked in no mirror not a pool of cold water. When I must drink, I stir my hands first, to break up my image. There are certain linguistic differences between standard American English and the Caribbean English represented here. I have live is a noticeable grammatical difference between the two dialects. It certainly signals to the reader that this is an islander speaking. The speaker is consistent with this, too. I have look in no mirror. Macaque also drops a few articles, without child, without wife. These are common grammatical differences between the two dialects. Except for these few grammatical differences, though, Macaque's dialogue reads far closer to schoolroom English than my direct transcription of an actual speaker. If you've had the chance to look at my transcription, you've surely noticed the huge difference between the two renderings. Walcott sticks to dictionary spellings of all the words. His presentation makes no attempt to force an accent upon the reader. This choice makes it much easier for the reader to process the passage. The grammatical difference is enough to present the English in such a way that a reader knows this is the speech of an islander. But it's not overdoing things. Someone in Ireland, India, or Indiana could pick up this manuscript and understand the dialogue easily. And they'd all get that Macaque is speaking a Caribbean dialect, which, by the way, makes for some of the most beautiful, fluid poetry ever rendered into English, as Derek Walcott proved every time he set pen to paper. Do yourself a favor and read anything he wrote. Walcott will take your breath away. So let's see what that earlier transcription would look like if we followed Walcott's lead in the first place. Please take a moment to read the updated transcription, then we'll hear from the speaker again in her own words. But I have my three-year-old daughter, so I just hold on she. And while holding on she, I have to put in her right in front of me. And then my back to the wind, for nothing that coming won't catch she. Anyway, I end up with this. I end up with a lot of bruises. My daughter end up with a fracture arm. My son gets some stitches. But I just thank God for life. That's a lot better, right? It's capturing some of the differences in the two dialects without asking the reader to become an accent detective to figure out what's going on. This is not to say that deviating from traditional spelling in your character's idiolect is a bad move. We've seen Joyce Carol Oates doing it successfully to portray teenage idiolect. You want to come for a ride and don't you like my car? What this lesson might be more emblematic of 
is the idea that when portraying any character's idiolect, whether it be an accent, a dialect, a mannerism, or even that the character is seven years old, less is usually more. Remember that all speech on the page is a construct, a fabrication, and a mere representation. If you detach from the desire to make it seem real life, your dialogue will likely become sharper and more lifelike to your readers. Embrace the paradox of portraying dialogue. This, too, is part of the game. Dial back the realism halfway, then probably a little more. And always remember that words matter. So damn it, if you're gonna write people, be respectful. <laughs>